We are going to round out our tour of late 19th century elite party building with the Radical Civic Union, or UCR, of Argentina, which is one of the most important cases of an elite opposition party that wins power through an election by building an enduring base of mass support. It has been a long time since we have checked in on Argentina in this series. So I am going to start with a quick rundown on political developments there so that we can get a better sense of the political context in which the UCR develops. In a previous video, I mentioned that Argentina had developed a two-party system where the main axis of partisan conflict was over the balance of power between the national government and provincial governments. With the Unitarian Party favoring a strong national government and the Federalist Party favoring a much more decentralized political system. During the 1830s and 40s, Argentina experiences a series of partisan civil wars between these two parties. And these conflicts are eventually won by the Federalists, who initially restructured the country as a very loose confederation of provinces before finally adopting a more federal-style constitution in 1853. Around that time, the Unitarian-aligned province of Buenos Aires secedes from the Confederation, and it remains a separate country called the State of Buenos Aires throughout the 1850s. During this decade, both the Confederation and the State of Buenos Aires experienced their first periods of regular electoral competition. The party system in the Confederation is still dominated by the Federalist Party, though the Unitarians continue to hold on in some provinces. Meanwhile, in Buenos Aires, the old Federalist Unitarian Party system has broken down and it has been replaced by a new multi-party system with several new personalistic parties. In 1859, the Confederation invades the state of Buenos Aires in an attempt to reunify the country. This invasion is forced back, but then Buenos Aires launches a counter-invasion against the Confederation, winning a decisive victory over the Federalist armies at the Battle of Pabon in 1861. This conflict does end up reunifying Argentina, but this reunification takes place under the leadership of the governor of Buenos Aires, Bartolomé Mitre, rather than under the Federalist government of the Confederation. This distinction is important because Mitre is a former Unitarian, and he favors a much stronger central government than the Confederation had. During the next decade, Mitre and his successor Sarmiento embark on a state-building project that strengthens and modernizes the central government based in Buenos Aires. The Constitution of 1853 remains in effect, but the balance of power between the national and provincial governments has now shifted dramatically in favor of the national government. And many of the Federalist provincial caudillos are also removed from power at this time, and this greatly weakens the already declining Federalist Party. We are now up to the early 1870s. Bartolomé Mitre is launching a bid for a second term as president, but he has made quite a few enemies during his first term. Two of his main rivals, Alfonso Alcina and Nicolás Avellaneda, decide that Mitre must be defeated at all costs. And so they join together, uniting their two parties into a new party called the National Autonomous Party. After Avajaneda defeats Mitre in the presidential election of 1874, the National Autonomous Party co-opts most of the old Federalist Party and even part of Mitre's own Nationalist Party. Thanks to this co-optation, the National Autonomous Party becomes an unstoppable force that wins all of the following elections by enormous marches. There is still a political opposition based mostly in Buenos Aires, but the national autonomists now have a secure lock on Argentina's elections for the next two generations. 
the National Autonomous Party becomes the party of Argentina's oligarchy. It is an alliance of a bunch of provincial leaders, large landowners or estancieros, and businessmen similar to the civil party in Peru that we saw in the last video. It is under the national autonomous governments that Argentina's export economy really takes off. This regime is trying to transform Argentina into the breadbasket of the world, and these efforts are aided by some important technological changes that has made it possible for Argentina to export grain and especially meat to Europe and North America. By the end of the 19th century, this export economy has made Argentina one of the wealthiest countries in the world, and it has a GDP per capita similar to that of France and the Netherlands. But GDP per capita is an average, and this figure obscures truly incredible levels of income and wealth inequality in Argentina at this time. Most of these economic gains have gone into the pockets of a tiny land-owning elite that is tied to the ruling National Autonomous Party. Meanwhile, large swaths of the population continue to live in abject poverty and under truly brutal working conditions. Argentina's agro-export economy had been relying heavily on immigrant labor imported from Southern and Eastern Europe, but Argentina experiences a major famine followed by a financial crisis in 1890 that decimates its export industry and throws many of these immigrant workers out of work. Some of these workers return to Europe but many are unable to afford passage back across the Atlantic, and they are now trapped without a job in a country whose language they barely speak. Argentina in the 1890s has become a powder keg. While the National Autonomous Party faces no real risk of losing an election anytime soon, there is widespread popular discontent about the way that things are going in Argentina. The Argentine working class, and especially the immigrant working class, are completely excluded from Argentina's oligarchic political system. And it is only a matter of time before they turn to more violent solutions to their problems. It is during this 1890 crisis that various opposition groups unite into a single opposition party called the Civic Union. The Civic Union is a broad coalition of various groups that have grievances against the national autonomous regime, including supporters of the former president Bartolome Mitre, who are angry that their guy didn't get to be president again, Catholic activists who are angry about the regime's anti-clerical reforms, urban professionals who are angry that they have no real voice in Argentina's government, and a collection of urban political bosses who had emerged during the more competitive period of the 50s and 60s and who are now angry that the ruling party's firm lock on the political system has made them irrelevant. The Civic Union has ostensibly formed for the purpose of running a joint opposition candidate in the next election in 1892, but before that can happen, some of the party's members stage a revolutionary uprising in Buenos Aires in the winter of 1890, known as the Revolution of the Park. This uprising is put down after a few days, but it does succeed at forcing a few concessions from the National Autonomous Government. The president resigns his office and his successor forms a coalition government that includes some members of the civic union opposition. However, this informal coalition is rejected by the left wing of the civic union, which breaks away and forms a new party called the Radical Civic Union, or UCR. The early UCR is led by two dominant figures, Leandro Alem and Bernardo de Irigoyen, who were both longtime political activists who shared a similar political trajectory. 
They were both born into federalist families. They had migrated to Alessina's autonomous party during Mitterrand's presidency in the 1860s before finally entering political opposition to the national autonomous regime. By the end of the 1890s, they are joined by a third and much younger leader called Ippolito Irigoyen. Despite their similar surnames, Ippolito and Bernardo Irigoyen are not related, though Ippolito is the nephew of Leandro Alem. The radical civic union is radical in its tactics, but it is not especially radical in its political goals. In many ways, the UCR is Argentina's most conservative party in the 1890s, at least in a philosophical sense, if not an ideological sense. The governing National Autonomous Party is the party of progress. It is a fundamentally liberal party that wants to enact sweeping social and economic transformations in Argentina, and it is always looking forward to some better and more prosperous future. By contrast, the UCR's rhetoric focuses heavily on an idealized past associated with that constitution of 1853, which had established a federal system with universal male suffrage. In the UCR's view, everything that has happened since Mitre took power in 1861 was a grievous error, including the state building and centralization reforms, the transition to an agro-export economy, and especially the consolidation of the national autonomous hegemony in Argentine politics. The UCR looked to the 1850s as a more democratic time when there was still meaningful electoral competition and when ordinary people still had some voice in the political process. According to the radicals, the ruling party, the National Autonomous Party, is a fundamentally illegitimate government that routinely violates the democratic constitution of 1853, and it must therefore be removed from power through any means necessary. In 1893, three years after the revolution of the park, the radicals staged a new revolutionary uprising. This uprising is much better organized and it is spread across several different provinces. And it briefly succeeds at capturing several of the provincial governments, including the governments of Buenos Aires and Santa Fe. But this uprising ultimately fails as well. All right, so we cannot take power through force. What about elections? Most of the elections in the provinces are locked up by the provincial political machines, but elections in Buenos Aires are still fairly competitive. The UCR starts running candidates in Buenos Aires and it builds what was then the strongest electoral party structure in the country. The radicals actually do pretty well for a time and they are able to get some of their people elected to Congress in 1894, including their main national leader, Leandro Alem. However, the radicals in Congress soon discover that there isn't actually much that they can accomplish there. They can use their positions as a platform for criticizing the incumbent government, but the National Autonomous Party has such firm control over Congress that a couple of radical congressmen aren't going to be able to make much of a difference in the national policy making. The radicals enter into a cycle of disillusionment in the mid-1890s, and then in 1896, the party's main national leader, Leandro Alem, decides that he has had enough and he commits suicide. Alem's death leads to a power struggle between the two Irigoyens. Bernardo wants the party to cozy up to Mitre and perhaps even the national autonomous government so that some of their members might get included in some future cabinet. But Hippolito wants the party to remain an intransigent opposition force. The UCR party organization ends up getting dissolved during this power struggle between these two men. 
And the UCR ceases to exist as an organized political party for several years. But a political integration eventually refounds the UCR in 1903, and he becomes the new organization's undisputed leader. So the radicals are now back, and one of the first things that the new party does is it stages another revolutionary uprising because the last two revolutions worked out so well. This 1905 uprising goes even more poorly for the radical rebels, and most of the party's leaders get arrested and sent to a prison camp in Patagonia. But this disaster of a revolution does accomplish one important thing. It reminds the general public that the UCR still exists, and that it is still an uncompromising opposition to the national autonomous regime. In 1906, amnesty enables the party to reemerge from underground, and the UCR now launches a protracted campaign to organize the Argentine masses into their party organization. This is one of the first cases of successful mass party building by an elite-led party in Latin America. The radical party leadership still consists of mostly large landowners and businessmen, but the radical party is now going out of its way to recruit middle-class and working-class activists into its ranks, and it has managed to convince a significant segment of the population that it represents a meaningful political alternative to the national autonomous regime. The UCR's reorganization as a mass party comes at a fortuitous time because Argentina undergoes a democratic opening during the early 1910s. The new president, Roque Sanz Peña, pushes his party to democratize Argentina's political system from within. Part of the reason why he does this is because he is confident that his party is still going to perform pretty well even under democratic elections. But much more importantly, Sanz Peña has concluded that the alternative to democratization would be much worse. For a long time, the UCR has been the main opposition to the national autonomous government, but by the early 20th century, the UCR is really the least of the government's wars. By this time, Argentina has developed a strong socialist party, the largest and best organized Marxist party in Latin America. But the thing that really frightens the national autonomous regime is the rapid growth of the anarchist labor movement. Sanz Peña worries that if the national autonomous regime continues to delay political reform, these leftist movements are only going to grow more powerful, and the regime may eventually be overthrown in some sort of socialist or anarchist revolution. Given this threat, it would be far safer to democratize the political system now and allow the UCR to win an election. A radical government is unlikely to pose any real risk to the material interests of the oligarchy because the UCR leadership is filled with a bunch of landowners just like the National Autonomous Party. But elections might still be able to serve as a sort of escape valve that undercuts the anarchist movement by channeling popular discontent away from direct action and into the electoral realm. In 1912, Sanz Peña pushes through an electoral reform known as the Sanz Peña Law. This reform makes it harder for the incumbent party to steal elections by introducing the secret ballot and by adjusting the electoral system in order to guarantee the minority party a third of the seats in each district. Argentina already had close to universal male suffrage since the 1853 constitution, though very few citizens voted in practice because elections were pretty meaningless under the national autonomous regime. 
This 1912 law changes that, and it increases the turnout rate to over 60% of registered voters in 1916. For these reasons, the implementation of this 1912 law is often considered to be the first instance of full electoral democracy in Latin America. This is it. Democracy is finally here. In the 1916 presidential election, the radical candidate Ipolito Irigoyen wins 44% of the electoral vote, but he falls short of the absolute majority in the electoral college required for him to win the election outright. There is a brief attempt to unite a right-wing majority in the electoral college behind the national autonomous candidate Rojas, so this effort ultimately collapses, and Irigoyen is declared the winner of the election, leading to the first transfer of power from one party to another since the reunification of Argentina in the 1860s. The outgoing National Autonomous Party fails to reorganize itself as a mass party like the UCR, and it becomes increasingly irrelevant in Argentine politics by the 1920s. Meanwhile, the UCR is now the leading party of Argentina's first democracy, and it wins the next two presidential elections in 1922 and 1928. Although Irigoyen himself gets ousted from power in a coup in 1930, his party, the UCR, survives, and it remains one of the two main political forces in Argentina's party system all the way through the end of the 20th century. <laughs> 